Welcome back, everybody, to your daily update on the state of the Malazan Empire, which is no longer really daily, but we'll come to that. Point is, we're back with Malazan, and uh, we're starting Return of the Crimson Guard today. I am super excited about it. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> let's get into it, shall we? Well, cheers. So yeah, I guess some of you remember me going to the festival over the weekend and uh, <laughs> recording the video really early in the morning and then it took all day because of travel and stuff to actually edit and whatnot. <laughs> and by the time I uploaded it and chose a title, I totally had to um, drop an F-bomb in there because, you know, I've been to several bars in between <laughs> and like a very good... Um, social media content creator, I totally took my camera with me and, um, yeah, then forgot to record everything. <laughs> when I came back, I found out that there's, like, more pictures of me on, like, <laughs> friends' social media profiles than there are on mine. So, yeah, maybe next time I'll go somewhere, I'll actually remember to do some, literal, like, actual recording and stuff, if... Any of you are interested in that, of course. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so I returned, and it was was still like really fucking awesome to finally get out into a crowd, like at a metal concert and everything. And um, yeah, it was just great. Plus, you know, hiking, going to these very specific um, communal beer brewing places in the Upper Palatinate, which was fantastic because they have very individual <laughs> beers there, great food. Fantastic stuff, but I forgot to take pictures um, or video because I'm an idiot. But you already know that. So um, let's talk about where we're going from here. Plan for me is to um, um, do eight videos on Return of the Crimson Guard. I looked at it, it's, the audiobook is 32 hours long, that makes a lot of sense. The chapters are pretty long. So it's usually like two chapters kind of make up for like four hours which would fit perfectly so that's sort of the plan to the first half of the book this week the other the second half next week and then we can all relax and talk about stone wielder or something like that the rest of my daily reading i'll just um spend on the um age of madness trilogy um which you know wisdom of crowds came out today so i figured might be a good idea to do that. Um, and then Leoness. I know a lot of you said that you wanted to hear me talk about Leoness, and I really want to do that. I'll, um, I just thought that on the other hand, what with Wisdom of Crowds being released today, not waiting until the end of the year might be a good idea with that. Um, also, I've I mean, it's it's Joe Abercrombie. I'll be done with that one real quickly because it's not exactly like a, a book where I need to think about every single sentence. At least I think so. Um, so that that's sort of the plan. Also, we've just reached 630 subscribers, and I'm super, super thankful for all of that. And it also means that we're like only 36 subscribers away from me doing the um, heavy metal and fantasy literature video thing that I that I kind of promised some people, at least, to make at some point, and I figured the 666 subscribers would be really cool for that. I might even drag out my upside-down cross necklace for that one, if I can find it, <laughs> to be more satanic. I don't know. <laughs> but let's have a talk about Crimson Guard now, Return of the Crimson Guard now. So, I know for a lot of people, this one's supposed to be um, the worst, Malazan Universe book, or at least the um, the least beloved of in Cameron Esselman's novels. I just watched Andy Smith's video on it, and he was pretty harsh on it. And while I see some of the criticisms, I don't share them. And it's certainly something that I feel we'll have to address a couple of times in this book. Um, I just read the prologue and chapters one and two today, so that's sort of where we stick with today. One of the first things that I um, 
will say here is this is my second reading of Return of the Crimson Guard. I read it, I don't know, before Path to Ascendancy uh, came out, before Dance's Lament came out. And um, one thing I realized is, now that I just recently did the reread of those three books, and have a lot of the events there like still kind of present in my mind, I appreciate a lot of the things happening in Return of the Crimson Guard a lot more than I probably did the first time around, because there's a lot of connection and interconnection between especially Cat and Vets Reach and Return of the Crimson Guard, more than between the Path to Ascendancy stuff and Knight of Knives, I feel. So that certainly helps. So I guess one of my um, <laughs> one of my recommendations for like reading orders and whatnot is to for people to maybe go and read the Path to Ascendancy trilogy before reading the novels in the Last an Empire. I I feel like you get more out of them because you can see um, how characters change in a lot of ways. Will there be spoilers in there? Probably. <laughs> But they'll be in the air the other way around as well, so don't worry about that. Um, so yeah, that's one thing that I realized. We're going to talk about like a few instances of that relatively quickly as well. The other thing that I find interesting, I mean, where I see where the comparisons to uh, Steven Erickson come from here, apart from it obviously being in the same world, is that the style shifts between Knight of Knives and this one. Well, not the actual writing voice, but uh, although maybe, although I don't think that much, but um, the whole layout construction of the novel seems more Steven Erickson-esque, which, you know, is bullshit. It is still very much its own thing, but you suddenly have a larger scope. It is much a much thicker book. You have way more different characters spread out all over the place. You. We jump around way more. We have uh, the novel separated into different books. We have chapter like epigraphs, all of that stuff. We have an have a prologue that is takes place I don't know eons before the actual novel. All of that makes it on the outside look way more Steven Erickson. So when you then open it and read it, and you get the very distinct voice and prose of. Um, Cam Aslamont, you, um, there is a chance you will be disappointed because you've grown up, well, not grown up, but you've got, gotten used to Stephen Erickson's very distinct way of um, philosophically meandering through things, and that's not what you get here. So I can see where that disappointment comes from, but I feel it is more one more a problem of like the wrong expectations of expectation management. This is a different book. It just feels similar in a few ways. But so maybe does Dune, for example, which has also like chapter heading, uh, epigraphs and stuff like that. <laughs> and it's obviously its own thing. Um, just saying. So there is um, that danger of falling into that trap. Um, and I'll try to avoid. So let's look into what we get there in those first two chapters and where this will all be going. We obviously have, as I said, connections to Path to Ascendancy that I'm like very happy about. One of them is in one of the first scenes in chapter two, uh, when we meet Possum, the um, claw um, dude. <laughs> Um, when we have him uh, attend the execution, the very, very brutal execution of someone, a, a mage, while he is waiting for the mage's sister to kill her. And this is something that, like, even, like, in, like, if I read it in a month, I probably had forgotten because my mind is, um, <laughs> not a very good mind indeed. <laughs> um... But those two, Janelle and Janelle, are like featured in Kelenvet's Reach. They're the twins near the end, when the brother, the mage who gets executed now, um, sacrifices part of his lifespan to the Wax Witch, um, uh, who may or may not be the same one that we meet at the beginning of Garden of the Moon. Um, 
to save his sister's life so they can grow older together. And um, so having those two crop up, and I definitely would have forgotten those two, but have those, th this kind of connection there just was felt really cool. Also, when you think about like what we learned about them in uh, Kellenved's Reach, to now look at it and see how they now actually, after the sharing of life force and so forth, die together on the same day as twins, gives the whole thing a poetic end, but also a sad one. Another one is that um, with all the stuff that is set up here with all the these members of what you might call the old guard um, being dissatisfied with the way the Empire is running at the moment, or it has, has been run by last scene for a while. Having seen all those characters from the old guard, pretty that we, you know, having seen them before in Path to Ascendancy really helps to put stuff into place. And I feel this is important because um, when you start reading it for the first time without that knowledge, it feels like um, an unnecessarily large cast of characters. Why is there Quinn in there? Why is... Who is General Choss? All of those things that we... If you have... Without reading Path to Ascendancy, you just don't notice. Like, why do we need even more names? What's the point of this? But what you realize with something like Path to Ascendancy written the way it is by now is like that this world is huge and this stuff was already probably part at least in uh, Cam Esselmont's mind when he wrote Return of the Crimson Guard it's just not that it was it, it, it's just that it wasn't available to us of the readers because we uh, didn't game on at the table with Cam and Steve in the early 80s so these ideas of like the old guard starting to be dissatis dissatisfied feels more real now that you know how the old guard were back in the time when they actually built the empire and how, how large their stake in the empire is. How large their trust, especially someone's like Urko's trust uh, um, in La Cine certainly was at the time. So, to realize the level of betrayal, but also the level of understanding why the Empire has turned into the place that it has turned into, is, um, is I feel, more understandable, at least for me now that I've read the other stuff as well. So... Um, Let's look at the Empire. <clears throat> and what we see here is a kind of breakdown of some of the more important aspects of the Malazan Empire. When we learn about the Malazan Empire in Garden of the Moon and other parts, one thing that is always apparent is that the the success of the Malazans when conquering places is at least in a large part due to the fact that they bring, that they actively fight corruption, um, they bring changes to civil authority, to bureaucracy, that in large parts lead to economic success and growth in those conquered regions, which will then gain them, um, you know, popular support in those places. We have those situations where the sappers build wells and all of that stuff and you make those people more successful that's how that kind of thing works but what we also learn over time in the Malazan Book of the Fallen especially in Dead House Gates um, where it is rather explicit um, when it comes to the rebellion in Seven Cities and what we we'll learn here is um, that some of those old elites that were potentially <laughs> Well, defeated by Kellen Bed and Dancer, have crept into the the body of the Empire, and all these issues of, of feudalism, the, the feuding <laughs> between, between noble houses, the, the the growth of the these mercantile elites, all of that, all of the corruption that comes with that, leads to um, all kinds of problems. And um, what we learn is that 
Lassine seems to not be able to do um, uh, to do something about that because she feels, I guess, up to a point that she needs some of that support. I mean, we have those ideas of the, the cult where the nobility gets put back in line, but only in parts. <laughs> So we see that creep in even more here. We have these small scenes of the the, um, the coast guards thinking about like extorting money from the from the merchants that um, flee unrest, civil unrest with all their money and stuff. You see how that rigid structure that the Malazan Empire imposed on those places. And we're talking here about, among other things, the. Um, um, the continent of Quantali, which is sort of the most civilized place when we start the whole thing up. Um, and the old hegemon hegemony before the whole the Malazan Empire gets really going. Even there we see the civil unrest start again. We see all these old elites coming up again. And um, all of that stuff. Um, so... Um, Yes, as I said, um, we see how deep the rot is going. We um, know about the whole Wiccan situation. We see to the, uh, where that leads with um, those uh, supposed settlers, which are basically just bandits going out there and murdering people and uh, raping people because they're assholes. So what we see there is that um, Lassine giving in to civil unrest by basically um, sacrificing parts of her population and parts of the population that were extremely helpful in other parts of the situations further destabilizes the empire um, because it, it lays the axe to what is the part of the core of the empire that being firm laws that were mostly observed and yeah that's something that we see a lot of in these first chapters here um, and I feel this is important to look at obviously the way the Wiccans are treated is something that we will see more of in the future and there's there's obviously a more commentary there on how that happens and what is done to the seti on the other side um, as well um, but we're gonna keep that for tomorrow or the day after when we reach more of the seti and um, more of their like plot lines so um, just keep that already in mind that this is an important aspect of these first chapters a lot of these small jumps around are I feel in order to um, paint that picture of a of an empire that is losing its moral uh, core um, so we have some of those old guard people who decided to um, uh, do something about that, and it's cool to see well, Erko back, Tuck the Elder back, and that that scene when Tuck the Elder just goes out there and takes over the city and knocks out that <laughs> terrible fool of a high of a fist. It's just really cool. What it actually reminded me of is that scene in the Hour of the Dragon, when Conan just shows up on that on that ship and just. Where he's just been put on the ship and um, as a slave to row, and um, he just jumps up, and all the other slaves know him from his pirate days and go, when he's like, "What's my name? Amra, Amra." And here we have the whole scene with like, Tuck the Elder going out there and like, "What's my name?" And everyone remembers him for, to be Tuck the Elder, and and they're like, you know, <laughs> just feels like an a really cool scene. And th but this brings me to another thing that I find interesting and important with um cam esselman's writing he's a bit more direct in picking scenes from classic literature well, classic fantasy in a lot of ways um it feels at least to me a bit closer oftentimes a bit more direct and um 
making those connections helps me like these scenes because if I already have like connections to a similar scenes plus it would really look great in a movie just saying <laughs> so there's that part um, so let's look at one or some of the other stuff that's going on the Kyle stuff the Kyle stuff I feel is really important because it kind of gives us a a look at the Crimson Guard and the interesting thing with the whole like Return of the Crimson Guard part here in the Crimson Guard is the Crimson Guard is not really better off than um, the Malazan Empire at this point. They have also very much lost part of what made them who they were. Well, for one, they have lost their prince and leader, Prince Kaaz. But there might be other things that were also going wrong, so... <clears throat> having that whole, um, as a starting point, gives us that parallel of two organizations that for a long time defined themselves by or through being opponents. Um, both being kind of down on or like losing the, these identities in a way. And in both cases we are working towards um, uh, or we're looking at how those two organizations try to recapture their um, their past identity, in a way. The, the Crimson Guard is on its way back home to fight the Malazans again, because that's sort of what gives them purpose. And on the other hand, you have people like Urko and Tuck the Elder and Chas and Amaron, possibly even Carthron, um, also trying to... Um, I mean, th these are still like old people, so the plan, their plan of whatever it is, obviously it's a coup or a rebellion or whatever it is, will certainly not modernize the Empire. It is certainly also, I guess, motivated by an attempt to return the Empire to what it was supposed to be. <laughs> so we have those two um, fundamentally backwards-facing strategies, right? Those are both, like, oriented towards the past. And the question is, do we have anyone who is actually looking into the future and would that not be, you know, more um, helpful? Because what the Malazan Empire or the Malazan world in general not it, is not is a very is conservative or focused on tradition. Does it um, deal with problems of um, how um, more conservative or how less um, sophisticated or less um, or Tech, less technologically of advanced um, peoples get crushed. Yes, we do that. Uh, we do see that a lot, and it's you know, it's sad, but it's never, you know, portrayed in that um, there was a golden age, and ever since we've gone down way that we see so often in in fantasy literature, uh, where things were better in the past. Um, so having those two factions here, the Crimson Guard and the Malazan Empire, kind of trying to recapture some former glory is really um, scary because that can't be that can't be the real you know solution. So we'll have to see where that whole thing is going. On the other hand, what is really important about the Kyle story is that we have once again an outsider. Um, a relatively inexperienced person getting in there, doing his thing, becoming part of the army, or maybe even not. And there's, there's a few interesting things here. On the one hand, we once again see um, Cam Asselman's strength, that being describing ships and ship stuff, or combat, or like that. Generally, um, Esselman's attention to detail when it comes to um, describing places or situations. There's a lot of attention to detail, how places look, and so forth, that you don't see that much of in uh, Steven Erickson's writing, at least most of the time. Um, we get a lot of that with Kyle, but we also see uh, get another thing. Um, that is um, Kyle getting a um, magical sword. Which, you know, is something of a trope. 
But this is <clears throat> this is where we see that already tropes are being subverted. Kyle is an outsider, and he is in there <clears throat> instead of learning or anything like that. He is fundamental. He, he is already faced with the question of like how to deal with um, the murder of that wind. <clears throat> thing, that magus or whatever it is. He doesn't understand it. In his worldview, it is possibly one of the founders of his people. So he kind of swears revenge on them, on the Crimson Guard, who is still part of and the, the way how those things play out are vital, because in a lot of fantasy literature, we kind of don't take that too much of too close a look on all these complex interactions or the, the interplay between different cultural backgrounds, the ignorance of uh, both sides in a way, um, the, uh, yeah, we don't take it, you know, we don't pay too much attention to that. And right now, with Kyle being our major focus here on this side, um, on in, in this particular story, um, we kind of have that thing going. We'll see where it will be going in the future. We also got a really cool scene with the dragon's deck, which is, I feel, the best explanation of how the dragon uh, deck of dragons actually works in the entire series. <coughs> so that one is pretty cool. Um, what else? Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where that whole thing is going in the next couple of chapters with Kyle and how, how they'll explain that, or how Esselmont will work that one out. Now let's look at the third big sort of plot line, and that is the traveling of Traveler and Eriko, a Thel Akai, which is really cool, because outside of Carcanas, this is the first time a Thel Akai showed up. And this one is, interestingly enough, also told in, you know, with flashback scenes. So we see how a traveler whom we have met before ends up in Corel on the Stormwall. We get our first actual scenes from the Stormwall. Um, how Eriko and Traveler flee because of Eriko's special connection to the Queen of Dreams. And... Um, That part is just like a quest. We still don't know where Traveler is heading. I mean, we know where he'll we know where where he'll end up, but there's obviously time between now and um, whatever happens in um, To All the Hounds. So having those scenes also builds a lot of stuff up for later novels. Like Corel is one of the continents that you know will be pivotal in stone wielder the storm wall all of that stuff is already kind of built up here so that one's that's just like really cool also we get another look at at dasem or traveler in an interesting way through another person's eyes we learn more about how scary he is where whereas in <laughs> Um, in Path to Ascendancy, when we saw Dasem, he was mostly a very, very tight, up, uptight person who got on everyone's nerves just for being so super, super disciplined in a lot of ways. And um, now we see him as a way more scary person. He is inspired loyalty in when we were saw about it from uh, from Temper's viewpoints and stuff. But now with Eriko, there's always that underlying fear because. He has gathered even more, like, destiny, personality, whatever, to himself. I mean, he is technically an ascendant at this point, or a god. So, I found that really interesting to see how that it kind of, you know, shows in a way. <clears throat> how there is that, up to a point, I almost, I don't want to say a loss of humanity, because he's obviously still human, but he becomes more distant in a way from just being a person through gathering all that uh, momentum as a larger being at this point. So I feel like it's all in all a pretty cool setup. We have 
the rot in the empire, the the beginning of the of the rebellion there with all those cool aspects of all the old people all the old guards showing up and giving it one more final try and all of that which you know tugs the hard strings and everything but it is fundamentally doomed we have Lassine trying to actually do her thing we'll see more of her we have Malik Rel showing up and for the first time we actually get Malik Rel's viewpoint not much of it yet, but it will certainly be interesting to see more of that later on. Um, I feel that's sort of like the one thing that I find really fascinating is like how well integrated all of this is, right? 